Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook live video feed, the link to which I will now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Tonight, our featured guests are members of the Del Sol String Quartet, violinist Sam Weiser and Benjamin Kreif, violist Charlton Lee, and cellist Catherine Bates. We are also pleased to be joined by Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. Welcome to all. Ch Charlton, uh, uh, I'd like to start with you. You're the members violist. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you uh, met all of the other members of the Del Sol String Quartet? Sure, great to be here. We started, uh, or I started the quartet about almost 30 years ago now, and, um, and people have come on at different times. So it, it's been a, an incredibly wonderful ride for a long time. And can you tell us a little bit uh, more about yourself, where you come from, uh, how you got into viola playing? Sure. My, I was actually, I originally studied math and physics in college, um, and I was working uh, in a high energy physics lab. At which point I started to think, no matter what I do in that field, it's like the number of people who could really appreciate what I'm doing and enjoy what I <laughs> get some enjoyment out of it was pretty limited. And so instead I went into a really popular field like new music. <laughs> string quartet new music. Yeah, string quartet new music. <laughs> anyway, it, 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 you know, I, I think that the idea that I could still share something that I was passionate about with people um, is, is much more exciting when I'm performing on stage. Okay. Catherine, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You're the group's cellist. Yeah, I'm Catherine Bates. Um, I'm originally from Boston and I found my way out to the um, US West Coast and um, met up with Del Sol here. And as Charlton said, this, this group started out of Charlton's um, desire to share music with, with more people, but also to really live on that edge of finding something that's um, just being curious about life and being able to share music that is exploring all sorts of different things. And so um, when the, the cellist of, was, uh, was a friend of mine who was leaving the quartet many years ago, um, I auditioned for the group and have been the, now the, the longest, by many, many years, the longest cellist of the, of the group. Um, and have really together, we forged um, a very distinct sort of voice and place in our community uh, with the work that we're doing. And so Catherine, you um, come from Boston and now all of you are in the Bay Area, is that right, near, near San Francisco? Yeah, the, the quartet is, um, in the, is based in San Francisco um, and it has been for uh, the 30 years that the quartet has been around. And we very much take our identity from um, West Coast and really specifically Bay Area musical traditions. And so we work with a lot of composers uh, that live here or embody the ideals or the um, the ideas that a lot of which have been cultivated here um, and explored here so okay uh sam you're the one of the violinists i'm not sure if uh, you two uh, you and ben uh switch between first and second violins or you are the first violinist and ben is the second or um could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how uh, yeah how you got uh, became a member of the quartet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do switch, so we are both uh, violinists of the quartet. Uh, there's no no hierarchy there. And uh, I'm the newest member of the quartet. I joined only three years ago, 
and uh, like Catherine, am a transplant to the West Coast. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast and uh, did my undergrad in Boston. And um, yeah, it's it's been an incredible time to be part of the quartet. Um, playing quartets and playing new music have always really been passions of mine. Um, and I feel very lucky to get to do both of those things uh, with the three other guys. And you identify with what Catherine was talking about, the new music scene or the music scene of San Francisco. Did you have a similar experience when you came from the East Coast? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, coming out here, uh, I came out here for my master's. Um, and I think that really what struck me was a real sense of collaboration and of inclusivity in San Francisco in the music scene. And um, yeah, just incredibly rich and vibrant and uh, very fun to be a part of. Fantastic. Ben, so you're one of the violinists, not the first, yeah. not the second, but just one. Can you tell uh, or, us a little bit about yourself and how you got to, uh, came into contact with the quartet? Yeah, I'm the other violinist. And um, yeah, I just feel really lucky to uh, get to play with with my friends. And um, also that since we collaborate so much with composers, it's great to get to build a piece of music from the ground up, you know, not to uh, join in um, 200 years late, but uh, get to see it sprout. And um, I'm originally from a, a small town a little north of San Francisco called Davis. Um, so perhaps rather than having an outsider's appreciation for a kind of Bay Area art tradition and new music, I, I actually kind of grew up with it, um, which is odd because it, it seems normal to me, um, which it probably isn't. So um, I'm happy to be be doing what I like to do. Okay. And and, and especially the um, the sort of community involvement that Catherine mentioned is an especially rewarding part of the quartet. And that's what you, what you mean when you say that you are, you were raised with that. So it's nothing new, but you can still uh, recognize it. Is that right? Oh, um, well, perhaps what I mean is that the idiosyncratic characteristics of of Bay Area art don't seem odd to me. They seem wonderful and natural. Okay. And those idiosyncrasies, could you give us some examples how they're different from other places or, or what they mean exactly? Yes, I, I think there's a, a long tradition of what is sort of considered outsider artists in Bay Area new music. Um, and as opposed to a more sort of conservatory trained emphasis um, in some other traditions, one of the ways an openness to non European non Western musical traditions, which partly just comes from our geography and partly the relation of San Francisco to the, the rest of the United States. Um, and one of the ways this has manifested itself, I think, is through a lot of instrument inventors and people who delved into alternate tuning systems, um, because those assumptions were not a given necessarily in the Bay Area in the same way they might have been in a place like, say, Boston, which has a stronger connection, perhaps, to Europe. Okay, so let's take a look now at the Del Sol String Quartet and their playing. Okay, I guess we are having a problem with that video at the moment. So can you tell us a uh, um Tell us, tell us a little bit uh, about that, please, Charlton. Tell us what exactly we were taking a look at, and then maybe we'll try again to uh, see if it downloads. Great. So the, some of the three pillars of what we really talk about within the group is the sense of community, curiosity, and generosity. And, um, and, and what you saw there was an excerpt of uh, one of our Joy Project pieces which we'll discuss a little bit more in depth later. But the idea that during this pandemic, um, this, during this really crazy time when we could not share our music in concert halls, 
we went out into the streets and, and just started to play pop-up concerts all over the Bay Area, um, commissioning over 20 new pieces from various composers, uh, many of them who were based here, and, um, and just on the theme of joy, right? And, and, just, and the idea that we could just go out and, and be a part of our community and give back um, a little something uh, during this you know, really ridiculous time. Okay, and Catherine, can you tell us, is this Joy Joy project, was it uh, one of your ideas or did you all, do you have a, a Monday meeting at nine o'clock uh, every week to discuss, you know, what your next project is or how did such a thing come about? Um, we had a Monday and a Tuesday and a Wednesday and a Thursday and a Friday meeting. <laughs> uh, um, during the pandemic, for the first time in the, in, um, we were separated for three months and weren't able to rehearse at which point we were able to find a way to be back together. And during that time, we, we did a lot of soul searching and I think a lot of idea generation about what this pandemic was gonna mean for us. Um, I know that Ben was responsible for a lot of the ideas behind the Joy Project, but again, it did come out of our group sensibility about wanting to share something with the community and wanting to be able to perform because that's important for us as musicians is to be able to have that connection with the audience and so uh he, we had an idea well what if we did go play outdoors and ben said well what why is this going to be any different than the rest of what other people will do because a lot of people will be playing outdoors and so uh yeah ben said why don't we make this exclusive by playing all new pieces that are written specifically to inspire joy. Um, and so we got the t-shirts and, um, and we've been traversing around the Bay Area, really getting to know our hyper local neighborhoods and street parks and really discovering about um, where, what works well outside because it's different than in the concert hall. And why do people stop and listen to music and who, um, and we've had just incredible appreciation um, for the gift that we've we are giving and that we've been given. And okay, uh, we, yeah. Sam, Sam, can you uh, is this kind of what you're talking about idiosyncratic? Maybe in Boston, uh, people would think, oh, that's too amateur. A professional string quartet goes to Symphony Hall to perform. They don't go to some park and wear T-shirts. I mean, I think the expectations of um, what a string quartet is it's not about Boston, it's about everywhere. I mean, there's there's such a tradition of what a string quartet is and does and what a classical music concert is and how it goes and what music is there and how people react to it and how people go to it. And uh, there's this incredible ethos about it. And, you know, uh, I feel very lucky to be part of that. Um, it's part of what makes string quartets amazing. And there's a reason that we want to go back and hear uh, Beethoven, and we want to hear the Juilliard String Quartet uh, play all these, you know, master works. Um, but I think it's equally important and important to all of us um, in the quartet that music has a place outside of the concert hall and that the way that we listen and experience, listen to and experience music is so much more um, rounded of an experience than what you know than maybe what the limited experience is that we're very used to in classical music about a concert hall about you know an auditorium that is of x size and that has acoustics that exactly line up to x and y or else you know uh, uh we as string players do what we do best and complain about the acoustics in a room and you know that you're, you sit quietly and listen to long pieces of music and contemplate profound thoughts. Um, I think the Joy Project turns a lot of that on its head. Okay, Ben, uh, is that is that right? Um, is that um, more or less what Del Sol String Quartet is all about, what Sam just said? All sounds good to me. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think the other thing is um, the Joy Project it's wonderful to reach the listeners, the people who stop and um, and listen. It's wonderful for us. It's it really cheers us up getting out outdoors and and playing for appreciative listeners. Another part of it is that the composers are a big part of our community, and um, I think they're people. It's very important to them to have to be able to communicate with 
performing musicians and listeners. So that's another important part of the, the equation for me is that the composers had an outlet in a time that they otherwise would have felt isolated. So, um, Charlton, would you be able to tell us a little bit about uh, this photo? So it's fall, I guess, and you're all wearing masks outside and <laughs> it was clear uh, you're next to a cafe or something and it was uh, the season to vote, so it must be around November. Yeah, that actually is a, uh, it was a polling station. So we were uh, playing for the vote. So for, just for people who came out that day to vote, uh, they had a chance to listen to some live music. And this was in the, the election in November. So obviously a very important one for us. Okay, the presidential election. That's right. Okay, understood. And how, how did the uh, passers-by react? Oh yeah, they were, they were really excited and surprised. And you were playing uh, new music or Beethoven or both? No, it was all, all our, our music. Um, so it's all new music. So the Joy Project specifically is, it's um, an activity where we go and play outdoor concerts, but it's also a repertoire. So when we do the Joy Project, it's specifically from this canon that we've created of brand new pieces that are all written in the last year. Fantastic. From San Francisco composers. Um, um, mostly uh, from abroad as well, but yeah, the, uh, I think I would say them at least half of them are from the Bay Area and, and then or have some very strong Bay Area connection. Um, and then, you know, we actually the little clip that we heard earlier, um, Arabic is currently in Turkey. So. Oh, yeah, sure. He was also on one of our shows a while ago. Ah, so, okay. um, fantastic. I, I do Catherine, want to... Catherine oh, looks sorry. a little bit cold. <laughs> It was a very yeah. cold day. Um, as San Francisco weather goes, we've all learned to invest in, in very, very warm um, layers. Okay. But I think Sam wanted to say something, also Sam, share something please. about the project. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to quickly mention what a cool project Play for the Vote was. Um, I think it aligned with a lot of the values that uh, we had going for the Joy Project, um, Play for the Vote being uh, cellist Mike Block, uh, his brainchild, and uh, the idea that on polling day, people would want uh, some beautiful music to listen to. And so he organized uh, polling stations all around the country um, for there to be live music being played. Wow. Um, okay. And I think, yeah, I mean, I just think that that really aligned with exactly what we wanted to be doing with the Joy Project. And uh, this day was great. It was really, it felt really nice to be out there. And um, the people inside the polling station were incredibly nice and really grateful. And uh, yeah. Fantastic. So I don't know why my slides are not going either right now. So I'm having a little some multimedia problems. So I, I would like to um, bring in Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. Lino, hi. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here in Moraga in the East Bay. <laughs> so we're in the same time zone, at least. Um, very good to, to meet you all here. Uh, Myself being a concert pianist, um, I also am championing um, new music, new uh, composers. Um, so my question to you is, how do you, what are your criteria in um, selecting new music, uh, new composers that you're gonna be commissioning? How do, you, how do you weed out the good from the bad? You know, can you tell us some of your criteria? Uh, I'll jump in here a little bit. It's really hard. We we have, you know, people email us. It's not quite as bad now as it used to be, where people would just like send us packages with scores and stuff all the time out of the blue. Um, but we have found over the years that most of the composers we wind up working with, um, for better or for worse, have a direct personal connection to us. Um, somebody that we know have had some engagement with, um, or in many, many cases, they come recommended by some other composer uh, whom we trust. And I think that is also a very strong. So that, I mean, we, we have, you know, there are a lot of composers that we're close with and have worked very intimately with. And when one of them comes up, comes to us and say, hey, I have, I know somebody um, who is writing really well and check out this piece, we're going to take a really strong listen to it. 
and you know, and and in many cases, those wind up being new uh, connections that we make. There are also situations where um, we get invited to a festival or some type of concerts where we are um, basically engaged to play a piece of music and and you know to either a premiere or some other um, performance of a piece that the presenter wants to have played and um, in many cases the composer is there as well and many times those connections are built strongly it's like if it's a great piece we get to meet the composer we get along and then we build more um, we further the relationship as it goes on, commissioning new pieces and whatnot. Okay, so I'd like us uh, now to go on to the Angel Island project, which is seems to be in keeping with your idea, uh, your love of communicating with other people, and also it seems to be uh, with also politically charged topics. So this one is called, we'll watch the video, Your Wall is Our Canvas, the Angel Island Project. Many of these people were kept here for weeks, months, and in their frustration and sadness, they carved these poems into the walls. Our project is called the Angel Island Oratorio, and we are using as inspiration the poems carved in the walls of the detention center here mm -hmm. by Chinese detainees during the Chinese Exclusion Act years. Poems are very powerful. They're not just words, but in a way I could see the uh, hunger feeling. And I feel a sense of heaviness uh, in my heart. Yeah, but also very thankful to be able to uh, have a chance to create such a meaningful project. The amazing part of the Hewlett Grant is mm -hmm. that it covers not just the composer's commission, but it also allows the musicians um, funds to rehearse. The world premiere now is uh, we're planning for the fall of 2020. It will be on this very island. We're also planning uh, concerts in the city because uh, this is not just a local event. In a way, the message and the project itself, uh, we hope to resonate with uh, everyone. We think that the story of these mm -hmm. early immigrants is something that's universal to immigrants coming still. Okay, so uh, Ben, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how this project came about. I, I'd almost punt that one to Charlton and Catherine because they have a much deeper understanding of that. I think the example of that, you know, a building relationship with composers is um, the composer Huang Ro is probably a really great example. I, I first met him at a, a premiere of one of his quartets uh, that another group was playing. And, uh, you know, we, we got along and and a few years later, we, we also played some of his music for the Santa Fe Opera uh, because he was having a uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen opera premiered there. Um, and then at that time, I just, we were stunned um, by how well I thought he set music uh, to words, to music. And so we thought it would be really fascinating to do a project with him involving words. Uh, and, particularly in the Chinese language. Right, and particularly using Chinese. Um, I, I find, for my personal musical taste, a lot of people who use Chinese um, in a more so-called classical art music setting um, do it in a way that doesn't really uh, benefit the language. Um, and, and so, but I, I felt like one road did an amazing job. So when we came up with this idea about using these poems that were carved into the walls of Angel Island um, Detention Center, these were left there by these detainees who were stuck there for an unspecified amount of time, uh, sort of in this limbo land, 
uh, during the Chinese Exclusion Act years. Um, there's a lot to decipher there. I, I, put, I put up our um, the link to our Angel Island page. Um, anyway, there was they found well over a hundred poems that were carved into the walls. It's, it's kind of like Chinese graffiti, and um, and you know expressing their anger, expressing their hopes, um, their sadness, and we thought that you know we could make a really amazing project with Huang Ro on this and and it's finally come to be you can see on the video that was you know from before the pandemic hit and we were planning to have it happen last year um but it's finally going to happen next month so this is something wow. we're, we're super excited about Catherine could you tell us a little bit about your experience with getting to know these poems I have had never actually heard of Angel Island before uh, I met your quartet uh, can you tell us about these, how it, you discovered it, what your feelings were then, what they are now? Yeah, we've been, I mean, we've been dreaming about this project for over five years, so it's, it's been a long history. Um, when I first started, I didn't know about much about Angel Island beyond that it was there. Um, I didn't know the history, and so it's been a huge learning curve for us as well. Um, I think it's amazing because even in the Bay Area, even in, within San Francisco, many people have never been to the island and maybe don't even realize it's there and certainly don't realize that, that there's an immigration station that was a detention facility and that the history of these poems. Um, and so I think it's just an incredible, you know, just an in incredible like resource and um, richness of history that we want to bring to attention. And I think this project has really helped us um, amplify that a bit and then also really connect with people who um who also love this like love this history and want to share this and so we've been doing in the pandemic even we've been doing a lot of uh projects with other organizations um including three elderly elder women poets chinese women poets who are um preserving the hoisin wall language um which was the language spoken by most of those early detainees um, and the last voice on poets and, and we have been collaborating on um, projects with music and and poetry. Um, Jenny Lim, uh, Flo Ori Wong, and Nellie Wong. Um, Jenny Lim is one of the last uh, surviving author of the book Island, which is the book that um, really preserved the poems and translated them and gave a lot of the history and is, is the book that we refer people to when they want to learn more about these poems and the history. And, uh... Could one of you tell us about the poems? Or which which poem do you like? What what are they about? You know what? Um, I guess you're reading the English translations. Um, what um, what strikes you? What what has remained with you? What do you like? What do you dislike? I, I think I mean they the there's I mean there's over a hundred poems, so they they go in all sorts of different directions, and some of them are very dark and very despairing and some of them are looking for death and then other ones are more hopeful um but it's they really capture the feeling of being caught in between of not knowing whether they should come or whether they should go um there's a beautiful line about having no shore to land a land upon um which was one of my favorite lines that juan Ro has actually included in the oratorio and this idea that um you know, you've left behind everything for the hope of a better life and now you're stuck, you know. Um, so I think it, it really captures um, the way that we need to process through human emotion and these difficult experiences. Um, okay. So, yeah. um, and maybe, uh, Ben, I could ask you, uh, you were playing in that video. I think the composer's singing. Can you tell us, uh, Catherine said that her favorite line was included about no shore to land on. What, uh, what is, does the composer, how does he write the music? Is it mostly like we heard kind of static tones and recitation or um, what, is, uh, what is the oratorio like? What is the music writing like uh, and, uh, in relation to the text? Um, the, the excerpt you heard was actually just an improvisation. Uh, we were there in the space and decided to see how it felt to make music in the space. So that's not from the oratorio. Um, it is, so it's, it actually isn't all that similar to the uh, 
composed music. It, I mean, you're right. That's a sort of drone with a vocal improvisation, um, which I, I enjoyed very much. It's, he, he's a wonderful improviser. Um, so the oratorio is um, structured sort of in, in three, I guess interludes might be the wrong word because I don't know if you can start with an interlude, but um, so uh, instrumental sections, which are very strongly related, um, which have spoken text over them. And the spoken text is taken um, either from legal documents or newspapers or sort of um, racist screeds of the time. Um, and then between that, there are these three um, large choral settings, which um, I guess I would sort of describe as bringing wonderful elements of, of both Chinese opera and European oratorio tradition in that um, they have these wonderful arching melodies and, but the, the sense of choral setting feels very familiar to me, um, you know, someone who would play Handel Messiah every year and that, that sort of thing. Um, okay. So it's, it's incredibly satisfying um, in, in, in sort of, for someone who enjoys both types of music. Okay. And Sam, what about you? What struck you about this piece, about this music that you're preparing for the for performance after five years? Uh, you said you're one of the newer members, so maybe you haven't worked on it for five years. Tell us about your, uh, your experience with this music. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was when I joined the group, um, the Angel, Angel Island project was um, one of the big things to look forward to. Um, and so three years later, it feels uh really exciting and like it's going to be very cathartic to actually give the performance and the music is just shockingly beautiful i mean we, we have a really deep relationship with huang ro and uh, i think we're about to talk about a dust in time um the the album that we're releasing of uh his newest string quartet um but this music just the more we rehearse it the more we dive in um is is just wonderful. Okay, let's take a look at the a dust in time. Just like you said, the new CD release. Here it is. <laughs>
Okay, so tell us a little bit about that, um, Charlton, maybe we can begin with you. Tell us about this music, it seems very, very meditative. What's, um, uh, does it continue like that for the entire CD? So the, this piece, uh, just to give you a little context, this was actually premiered, I think, on the date that we were supposed to present the Angel Island project. Um, of course, because we knew that nothing could happen um, during that time, Huang Ro had then in his own sort of <clears throat> musical healing process for himself was tossing around an idea, kind of like a Pasacalia, and then came up with this, this it's an hour long meditative piece. Um, it starts actually very slowly, and this is like getting towards the peak, um, and it grows and, and then comes back down again the same way. Um, he was inspired in particular by the Tibetan Buddhist sand mandala and um, that <clears throat> concept of that you build something and then you take it away again. And, and I think that um, and what you're left behind, uh, his idea called a dust in time is that, you know, maybe there's a speck that's, that's missed and there's a speck that's sitting there still. And that's where we are um, during, it's like, we're going to pass through this time and then what will be left um, and contemplating that, that type of uh, those ideas. Okay. And this particular piece is what you saw, it was per um, the Mer that was the American premiere. Um, and that took place in Grace Cathedral here in town. Um, and we were sitting on top of their labyrinth as well. So it was kind of an interesting, it was a, an idea that they wanted to play with uh, between the, the mandala and then the labyrinth at the cathedral. Okay, so uh, I'd like to bring in Lino Rivera again. Lino? Yes, um, this is a question for everybody. Um, I have the pleasure of also working with composers and um, I'm just curious, when you're working with the living composers, um, how much input um, do you have for the composition? In, in other words, you know, could you say to the composer, you know what, this is not working very well. Would you, do you think, you know, our suggestion would be something like this? Uh, how much of that kind of an interaction do you have working with the living composer? You know, I think that depends on a whole lot of things, but, um, you know, it depends on our relationship with the composer. It, com it depends on who that composer is um, as a person and as a writer. And, you know, for example, we work with um, composers that come from a more heavy improvisational background. And of course, then um, those questions are often broader. Um, but, you know, in general, the idea that we get to collaborate on that level with the composers that we work with is, I think, a large reason of why all four of us feel so passionate about new music. Um, we get to have those sorts of conversations and wh whether it is in very little ways or in very big ways, um, at the end of the day, we are the ones performing the music and having um, an emotional response and forming an interpretation. And in that way, um, we get to have a conversation with the composer anyway. Um, and them being there for us to actually talk to uh, is an incredible boon that we uh, take advantage of as often as we can. Okay. Um, so I'd like to ask um, Ben, can you tell us about the CD release? It's a, a CD or it's going to be on Spotify. What exactly can, uh, can we look for and how can we get it? I, I keep handing your questions over to more knowledgeable people. Sam has been our liaison with the, uh, you know, the, the record company and he knows a lot more specifics about this and he's really, you know, why don't we have him answer that? 
Sure. Uh, yeah, we're releasing the album on October 15th uh, through Bright Shiny Things is the record label. And um, you can uh, get it wherever you listen to music, on Spotify, on Apple Music, um, on on any streaming platforms. Um, you can, of course, also buy the album. And something that we're especially excited about is that this album, uh, to buy a physical album is to buy a coloring book. Um, full of hand-drawn mandalas by an incredible teenage artist, Felicia Lee, um, from San Francisco. And she uh, hand-drew 16 mandalas um, for you to color in as you listen to the piece. I don't know if we've said this out loud yet. The piece itself is an hour long, and so the album is the one piece in its entirety. Um, you see uh, uh, on the right side of, I hope I got that right, left and right is hard. On the right side, I believe, of the page that you're looking at uh, are two of the mandalas that Felicia drew, um, one of which uh, she colored in to uh, further spark some imagination and also show off her incredible creative prowess. Um, and yeah, pre-orders for the album are out today, and on October 15th, you'll be able to buy uh, the music wherever or listen to the music wherever you listen to or buy music. Uh, um, but can, we're really, can you really tell excited us about more, the... Can you tell us more about these mandalas? What exactly is that? Uh, yeah, I mean, Huang Ro, as Charlton said, was inspired by the Tibetan practice, the Tibetan Buddhist practice of sand mandalas. Um, and we thought that as a way to um, enhance the listening experience and sort of deepen the meditation uh the meditative feeling of listening to this music um that we feel of course it's it's just hard i mean to be to be sort of frank about it like in in this day and age um to sit down for an hour and listen to a piece of music um is not a luxury that we all give ourselves um and with our phones and you know a text or a, a game on your phone like literally that far away um it can be easy a lot of times to get distracted and i think that uh, the mandala is a way to uh hopefully center yourself during this really special experience okay fantastic so let's click on this pre-order see what we get there it is wonderful so i will put this in the chat room there it is. So we look forward to hearing that album. Let's take a look now at Between Worlds of Sounds.
Fantastic. Wow. Uh, ben, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, is that what you mean by uh, the music scene that you grew up with? Uh, not particularly, but it, um, but that's just my own, own, um, own lack of, uh, of, of good luck. Um, although actually that's not entirely true in that, um, Alam Khan is, is, um, the son of Ali Akbar Khan, um, who was a, a really renowned, um, Sarod player who, who, and, and just all around musician who moved to California, um, I think in the. I, I, late sixties, early seventies, and started an academy. Um, and I, I did hear um, Ali Akbar Khan play in Davis um, several times. He, he would, he would. So I, I it um, wasn't actually what I had in mind, but I, I did have the opportunity to hear him play as a child. Um, yeah, but this is, um, you know, everyone has their. I think the actual, simply the openness of the scene in that um, it would occur to Alam to, you know, let's let's collaborate with the string quartet and um, see what comes with it is is perhaps very fitting though. And um, yeah. Okay. So Charlton, can you tell us a little bit about how you found these three other music collaborators? Uh, I don't imagine that uh, you can just uh, go and find a sitar player. Maybe tell us also about the instruments. I'll show them in a in a still frame of the video. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Right. So we had uh, Alam Khan on the sitar, um, and then uh, sorry on the sarod, and and then Arjun Verma on the sitar, and uh, Nilan Chaudhuri in on the tablas, and. Um, they actually found us <laughs> this again it's like this is part of i think you know the advantage of being in this area is that you know, there is this interplay between different cultures um they reached out and and asked if we would be interested in in putting together um a, a collaboration with them and uh we we were fortunate enough to get a a, a nice grant from the creative work fund which is uh a foundation that uh, a fund that uh, really supports the arts in the Bay Area, and has supported many incredible projects for decades. Okay, um, yeah. Charlton, maybe could you tell us? Uh, so tell us about this uh, this musician, and and so what instrument Al he's playing. Right, so that's Alam Khan, and mm -hmm. um, so he's uh, who Ben mentioned earlier. He's the son of Ali Akbar Khan, um, and we joke like you know basically in north indian musical royalty right his his grandfather uh, is also the teacher of um uh, ravi shankar so who you probably have heard of um and so he he is now the at least the, he's the he's running the school that his father established and um and that that instrument is the sarod is is, is really uh, gorgeous and, and and well they're all beautiful but that this one I think we 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 identify strongly with a, a, a plucked instrument that does, has no frets right since we don't use frets ourselves and so it's a it's a steel fingerboard there um, and there's you see many many strings but I think a lot of them are actually sympathetic strings that help create richness in the sound. Um, it's only playing on, I actually, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know really okay. enough about the instrument. And, and this in this instrument, uh, he got it uh, handed down or uh, you order Again, it from- Again, uh, I don't, that I don't know. A guitar I'm, shop? I'm or, sure, okay. I'm sure there are handed ones, ones that were handed down from his father. And, but okay. just like, you know, just like violins and cellos, there are contemporary makers and- Right. Yeah, so it's- Wow, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So that's there. And tell us about um, so the 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 musician in the middle. He's playing drums that have uh, tonalities, so you can hear them go up and down. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, they have a lot of different sounds that they do can make. And I, again, I couldn't explain to you what he's doing, but it's kind of magical. Okay, and then the last. And the, yeah, they're, they're called tablas. Mm -hmm. And then we have the sitar player. I think. 
yep. there on the extreme right. Yep. And that's um, a, a traditional Indian instrument, is that right? Yep, as well. Okay, fantastic. And tell us about the rehearsal pro process. Was there a lot of arguing or uh, did, what, did you guys all uh, play this uh, from sight the first time? So this was a, um, this was pretty much a reading. Uh, the, the the person that you don't see here is Jack Perla, who was um, who is a a composer, uh, a more Western style composer, who helped orchestrate and set some of our parts and and things. Um, so the the two the Arjun and Alam the the Sarod and sitar players they they're the ones who really spearheaded the creation of the music. And then it was broadened out to include us um, by Jack. Um, and what Nilan does, from what I understand, is is largely improvised based on his understanding of certain things that they tell him just ahead of time. <laughs> OK, fantastic. Great. So now uh, we just have a little bit of time left. I'd like us to talk about quickly the traditional North Indian musicians project. What is that exactly? That, that is that's this project. That's this project. With, oh, with excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, oh, no uh, worries. Yeah, they're um, so to be fair, uh, they the, those instruments and from my very, very limited understanding are, are more from the northern part of mm -hmm. India and, and other parts of India have different traditions and different instruments and and um, you know, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Understood. So fantastic. And we can, uh, that's an ongoing project and we uh, will be seeing more videos. We will be we, hearing that in concert. We are hoping. Um, this was another COVID casualty. Exactly. That is, um, this was our first COVID casualty. In fact, yeah. this was supposed to happen in May of last year and had to be canceled, of course. Um, and we don't know at this point still when, because it's quite a, you know, it's a larger group of people and, and there are concerns for various assorted reasons. Um, but I think we're going to try and create an album uh, at the end of the year. And uh, so that should be coming out sometime, I would imagine in the spring. Fantastic. So with our uh, final minutes, I'd like us to begin a round table in which each of you can uh, discuss the theme. The question is, what is the re relevance of a professional string quartet in today's West? So we have all of these multimedia, um, multimedia things available to us, like Zoom, like television. Uh, we can hear all of those instruments. Why have a, a string quartet playing instruments, meeting uh, for rehearsals, playing outside the Joy Project, playing in concert halls. What's the relevance today? Catherine, can we start with you? I mean, what's the relevance of anything? It's that it means something to someone. And, and the string quartet for each of us as individuals, I think, and certainly for me, is a very powerful medium about communication, about community, about relationships. And so for us, being able to communicate and to share relationships and to have relationships between ourselves, have a relationship with the audience, have relationships with the composers. It becomes an entire, an entire ecosystem, an entire pond um, of a way to find and share something beautiful and something meaningful and something deep. Um, and so it's uh, string quartet happens to be the one that I love. And uh, I think it has an incredible um, uh, sound quality and then, and it, it, in many ways evokes uh, the sonorities of the human voice. Uh, and so it's something that I have grown to love and, and that I think many people love. Um, so that's, that's my sort of okay. short answer. Ben, can you tell us, uh, is it still relevant today? What is, is the relevance? Oh, I, I really enjoyed Catherine's answer. That, that seems just right to me. Um, I, I mean, is it relevant today? I, doesn't need to be relevant to everyone, um, but it, it still speaks to me and it speaks to apparently enough other people that there's someone who wants to listen. Okay, Sam. 
Yeah. Um, I think that the way that we interact on stage um, is something that's really important and really universal. I mean, seeing people, you know, watching athletes be a team and being impressed by, you know, five basketball players sharing a court, um, being impressed by four musicians being able to listen to each other. I don't think it's entirely different. And, you know, uh, I have friends that I watch a lot of basketball with that don't really come to my concerts. And uh, I have a lot of friends who I will come to my, all my concerts and who would walk out of the room if I started talking to them about basketball. But uh, I think that there's a universality, that's a word, uh, about the way that we interact with each other. And um, in that way, yeah, I mean, it is relevant. So, Charlton, going back to you, the founder of the quartet, you spoke to us in the beginning about, um, yeah, this uh, this community, reaching out to new composers, creating new projects. It uh, it seems like it's really uh, come to fruition. You're like Catherine said, and Ben and Sam echoed this communication between many different parties who wouldn't normally communicate. Really seems to be thriving. Yeah, I'd like to take it maybe one step further. And um, my one of my favorite analogies is the um, since you know I grew up playing the violin and then the viola, trained in a Western classical tradition, um, and I like to think about that tradition as being you know something that started maybe in the medieval times, Renaissance, starting picking up a little steam. You get to the classical period and say you know the time. Beethoven, for a good example, it's like, and all of a sudden, it's like this stream has become a, a raging river. It's like strong current, a lot of power. Um, you get to Schoenberg, and you've reached the delta. You got get to Cage, and you've reached the ocean. At which point, we're no longer in a unidirectional model. It's now this swirling mass, um, and you have other rivers and streams coming into this same ocean, right? And that's kind of where we're at right now. And I think what's exciting about playing in a string quartet right now is that there are people all over the world who are writing pieces for string quartet, many of whom have very strong traditions from that are non-European uh, traditions that they're bringing to play into this particular combination of instruments. Um, and so it's really exciting that we are basically at play within this ocean um, and that we're able to use all the different sources and all the different traditions that people want to work with um, and we can you know, make it all happen, which is incredibly exciting for me. Wow. Well, thanks to the four of you for a, such an engaging conversation, for showing us what the Dell Soul String Quartet is all about. How uh, can we stay in touch with the Dell Soul String Quartet? Let's take a look now at their website. It's dellsoulquartet.com. So we have all the information about the quartet's musicians. We have those, uh, all, we can check in about all the projects that they have and uh, their ongoing projects that we learned about tonight. And then to contact them, just click on that. And there is the email. So Charlton, I believe uh, people uh, refer their questions to you. Is that right? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, wonderful. So there it is, delsoulquartet.com. So I will put that in the chat room. Wonderful. So um, once again, thank you so much to Charlton to uh, Catherine, Sam, and to Ben, thank you very much uh, for uh, introducing yourselves and showing us what the Del, Del Sol String Quartet is all about. Yeah, Real thank pleasure. you. Thank you. So let's take a look now at next Wednesday. We have Beatrice Benzi, Teatro alla Scala.
Milan's Teatro alla Scala may be the world's most renowned opera house, but more than a building, it's a living Italian cultural institution that has a vast workforce and even its own in-house Institute of Higher Education, Accademia alla Scala. Beatrice Benzi, a key member of the theater's music production team and faculty at the Accademia, will guide us through the inner workings of La Scala, as it's known, like no one else can. Come welcome Beatrice to our show. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simunemoro.com. So again, that's Beatrice Benzi, Teatro alla Scala, next Wednesday. So once again, thank you so much to the Del Sol String Quartet, to Sam Weiser, Benjamin Grief, Charlton Lee, and Catherine Bates. Thank you so much to Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. Most of all, thank you to you, our participants, who make it all worthwhile from Vienna, Austria, and from the Bay Area, California. Goodbye, and see you next Wednesday.